Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to the word of God recorded for us today in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. We will be reading today a portion of scripture, but we will be basing our sermon today on the Gospel reading from John, chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is the word of our God. You may be seated. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came into this world and lived among us and suffered the same kinds of problems and troubles and struggles, that we experience here today, dear friends. Hagar the Horrible was having a bad day. The comic strip, Little Viking, stands there in the middle of the sea on a rock, a lone rock, as the rain pelts his grizzled beard and he stands there shipwrecked raising his outstretched arms to the heavens and making the agonized cry, why me? And as he does so, from some unseen source on high comes the answer, why not? Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like life is just unfair? I don't know what you're doing to me, Lord. I feel like I need answers. I need answers to all of the problems in my life. I need answers from God. Lord, if you really are God, if you really are loving, if you really are in control, then why do things like this have to happen? And why why do they have to happen to me? Why do illness and pain and tragedy, why do these kinds of things have to be a part of life? Why? Well, it's a fair question. Why do we experience sickness and disease and tragedy here in this life? Why terrorism and tornadoes? Why wildfires and wars? In his word, the Lord does give us an answer. But it might not be the answer we like. And yet, it is an answer that is good and right. Whenever... I begin to ask the question, why me? I need to trust that everything that happens is ultimately for the glory of God and that in the end, it is for my own good. Life can be hard, even for Christians. And what we need to keep in mind as we go through the problems and the troubles and the struggles that we have in life is that God is still in control. And ultimately, that's what really matters. We turn the pages of Scripture to John chapter 9, and we see that Jesus is walking along, and he sees a man who has been born blind. His disciples ask Jesus a question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And it's a natural question. We sometimes think that way, right? If somebody is suffering, God must be punishing punishing this individual for a particular sin. What's God punishing this person for? It's got to be something. In the case of the blind man, it seems entirely unfair because he was blind from birth. So if he was blind from birth, he hadn't done anything to deserve some kind of punishment from God Could it be that this man is suffering because his parents did something wrong? And if so, that just doesn't seem right, does it? 
gets the disciples' question. And so Jesus gives his answer. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And he goes on to say, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What he's saying is don't think that because he sinned, that he committed some particular sin, that that's the reason that this man was born blind. And don't think it's because his parents have done anything wrong. Keep this in mind. It, it happened so that the glory of God could be displayed in this man's life. That's what Jesus tells his disciples. And then he adds another thought. He says, our time is limited. He says, we're here to do the Father's work, but let's do it while we still have the time. We have the light of God's word in our hearts, so let's take this time to let our light shine. Because the time is coming when no one can work. And then after he says this, Jesus does something that seems a little bit strange. He spits, and he, he makes a little bit of mud in the dirt with the spit, and he, he takes that mud, and then he, he applies it to the man's eyes, and he says, go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And as the blind man goes to the pool, and he washes the mud that Jesus has made off his eyes, something amazing takes place. He's now able to see now, as you can imagine, the whole incident causes a bit of a stir because as the man leaves the pool of Siloam and is walking about town, the people who know him recognize him. They know this was the blind man. <laughs> they now see that he's able to see. And as they see this, their reactions aren't entirely what we might expect. There are four different ways that different people react to this man's blindness being gone, the miracle that Jesus performed. The neighbors and the friends who knew this man are skeptical. They don't really quite understand what has happened here. They're surprised, but they're not quite sure that they can believe that this is exactly what's happened. Could this really be the same man? No, it only looks like him, they say. And so their minds dismiss what their eyes are clearly able to see. The Pharisees, well, they, they have to accept that a miracle occurred, but they have a prejudice against Jesus, and so they cannot accept the fact that Jesus is the one who has worked this miracle in this man. Look, this man isn't from God, it's the Sabbath. What prophet would ever do an act of kindness, that's work, on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. So if this man were from God, he wouldn't have done this. We can't believe in him. The man's parents have a totally different reaction. It's more of a reaction that comes out of fear. They don't want to upset the Pharisees. They don't want to say something that later on they're going to come to regret. So they're completely non-committal in the way they respond to the the, their, their sons being able now to see. They say, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. Something has changed here. But who it was who did this and how this happened, we're totally unable to say that. But our son, he's a grown man. He can talk for himself. Why don't you just go talk to him directly? So the Pharisees approached this blind man, this formerly blind man himself. And his response, they find, is a response of faith. Look, I don't know what you think, this man says, but I know what happened to me. I was blind. And now I'm able to see. The Pharisees don't like this answer. And so they throw insults at the man. But he's willing to accept their insults to be able to, to just speak the truth. He says, I already told you that he healed me. 
Why don't you listen? If this man were not from God, he would not have been, been able to do it. And do you see what makes all of this so fascinating? The man was somebody who was formerly blind. And he's able to see, he's able to perceive and understand what the Pharisees do not, what they do not want to see. He says, this man is a prophet. Whoever has done this is someone who comes from God. Their blindness, the blindness of the Pharisees, is clear. Ironically, they end up accusing this man of being a sinner. He's a loser. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us, they say to this man. Before we go any further in the story, it might be really good for us to pause and to think about what is actually happening here. The Pharisees are charging this man, this formerly blind man, with having been steeped in sin from birth. Just drenched in sin. That's what they say about him. And that, of course, was true. Because this man, this blind man, was born a sinner. What the Pharisees failed to see is that this was true of every one of them, too. Because we are all born sinners, steeped in sin, drenched in sin from the time that we are born. Steeped in sin at birth, that applies to the blind man, to the Pharisees, to the blind man's parents, to his friends and his neighbors. It applies to us, to all of us. It applies to everyone who's ever been born into this world except for one. And that is Jesus Christ who was born innocent and without sin of any kind. See, that's why we need Jesus. Our sins place us into a desperate situation because our sins merit hell. Not just the kind of pain and suffering and agony that we have to deal with in this life, but something that's far beyond what we experience as difficult as our life here at times might be. Our sins merit eternal separation from our God eternally. Separation from our Lord and his love and his protection. We need a savior. That's exactly why Jesus Christ came. Okay, so this whole incident seems to be getting around town. And people are talking about it. When Jesus catches wind of how this, this blind man, who hasn't done anything wrong, has been treated, he goes looking for him in compassion. And when he finds him, he asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? It's a fascinating conversation. The man asks, who is he, sir? And he says, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus says, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I'm the one who healed you. And the blind man responds in faith, Lord, I believe, and he worships him. So in retrospect, we can see that there was a reason, there appears to be a reason why Jesus made that mud and so curiously put it on the man's eyes and sent him off to wash in the pool. It's so that the man who has never seen Jesus up to this point has to go away from Jesus. And once he's able to see, to give testimony to what it was that Jesus had done for him in his life through the kind of powers that only God can have, without knowing exactly who Jesus was or recognizing him with his eyes. He was able to respond in faith and share what was in his heart with people who needed to hear that message. And now, seeing Jesus for the very first time, he is able to confess, 
fully and confidently, Lord, I believe. But now all of this brings us back to the original question, why? Why was this man born blind? If it wasn't because of some specific sin that he committed, then what was it? Why should God have caused somebody who has done really nothing to deserve an extra kind of punishment, why would he have caused him to be born this way? That's the million dollar question. Or if we can expand that question, why is it that so many people have to suffer here in this life? Why do we? Why is it that people that we know suffer from cancer and die from that terrible disease? Why do people we know suffer from diabetes and from heart disease? Why do we have to deal with this coronavirus that is going around? Why do our loved ones get hurt in traffic accidents? Why do some of them actually lose their lives? Why do people we know suffer from depression? Why does a young man need to undergo a heart transplant? Lord, why? Do we have to deal with these kinds of problems in our life? It's okay to ask. It's okay to question God. It's okay to say, I want to talk to the manager. I'd like an answer. But as we do so, we need to recognize that the answer may not be as complete or as satisfying as we might like it to be. I think we have the mentality at times that if I live right and I do everything the way I'm supposed to, then everything is going to go smoothly in my life. And if I have a problem, then we're inclined to say, what is it that I've done wrong? What is God punishing me for? All of that is natural, but that's not what God tells us in his word. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you're never going to have any problems in life. There are going to be challenges. We know that, even for Christians. Sometimes your dreams will be broken and your life will be shattered. But even amid all of those challenges and amid the shattered dreams and broken futures, we can still look to the Lord our God. Jesus said of the man's blindness, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Why me? Ultimately, it's for the glory of God, and it is for my own good. But I have to understand that God doesn't follow my rules. I can't tell him what to do, and I can't say, God, you didn't do what I wanted. Because he all owes me no explanation for the way he handles this world. He sees much more than I do. And I'm never going to have all those answers. But as I consider this question, why? Why me? I have the most important answer. And that is that Jesus Christ came. He was born as a baby in Bethlehem. He grew to become a man, and here in this life, he lived just like one of us. And as he did that, he experienced what we experienced. He suffered too. He suffered injustice. He suffered insults. He suffered pain. He suffered agony. And he understands. He gets it. He knows what we have to go through. He understands suffering and pain. And he wants you and me to know, look, I've got this. You're going to be okay. Just trust in me to make it all turn out in the end. Lord, why? Why me? Why us? Why do we have to go through suffering and pain why? I may not know all the answers, 
But I do know the most important one. I know that Jesus Christ is still in control. And ultimately, that makes all the difference. Amen. Please stand.